Dr. Rene Richards, the 42-year-old transsexual tennis player, moves into the second round of the Tennis Week tournament at South Orange, New Jersey, tomorrow. But she's no nearer gaining admission to the U.S. Tennis Open at Forest Hills, which begins next week. Forest Hills officials have demanded that she take a chromosome test, like those required of women athletes in the Olympics, to prove their femininity. Dr. Richards has refused to take the test and argues that her rights are being trampled on. At the same time, she's not unhappy that the so-called sex change tennis case has focused more public attention on transsexuals than anything since the notoriety over Christine Jorgensen in the 1950s. Dr. Richards lived as a man until last year. He was a successful ophthalmologist in New York and a ranked amateur tennis player. reassignment operation a year ago, Dr. Richards has been living in California and playing tennis as a that was fine until she decided to enter Forest Hills, the major tennis tournament in this country. Tonight, the problems of being a transsexual athlete, and more widely, the growing recognition of transsexualism and the problems of acceptance in American society. Dr. Richards, you want to play at Forest Hills. Why are you unwilling to accept a chromosome test? I'm unwilling to accept it because I don't think it's a good test for sexuality. Sexuality is many more things than what your sex chromosome pattern is. Uh, socially and legally, your sex chromosome pattern has nothing to do with it. I am a woman. My gynecologist will attest to that. My uh, documents all say that I am a woman and I live as one. Uh, to be asked to take the test that Forest Hills wants me to take uh, seems unfair. Uh, they are only going to pass those women who have a specific type of chromosome pattern. And that would eliminate, most likely, me. And it might eliminate some other women with abnormal chromosome patterns, too. Yeah. But you, um, you being a doctor yourself, uh, if you haven't already had a chromosome test as a result of I your haven't. recent experience, you might suppose that your chromosomes would turn out to have the pattern of a man's, might they not? They might, and I think uh, the probabilities are that they would show the male XY pattern. Yeah. But I don't think that it is a fair test for sex regardless of what the chromosome pattern might show. Wouldn't you, in fact, and I guess this is what is at the heart of this uh, controversy, wouldn't you, unless it's just pure prejudice, which we could come to in a minute, but wouldn't you, in fact, having been born with the body of a man and played tennis as a man and having the muscular structure of a man, have an unfair advantage when playing against women? I think that what you said just a moment ago is at the heart of it, uh, the, the heart of my being excluded is that people are afraid that I do have an unfair advantage having been a man. I don't think that this is so. There are many women athletes, tennis players, golfers, track stars who have height, weight, and muscle mass that is much stronger, bigger, or in whatever dimension you would want to measure it, than I. Uh, Betty Stowe from the Netherlands is 6'1 and 160 pounds, taller and heavier than I am. With the same proportion of muscle? With the same proportion of muscle. I think that you could do muscle mass testing, which can be done, uh, putting somebody in a certain kind of a chamber which uh, allows you to determine their fat muscle so you're saying there are other tests than the chromosome test which might reveal whether you would have an unfair advantage or Yes. I think that one of the most amusing things was that I read in the newspaper this afternoon, they asked Ilya Nastasi, who is uh, one of the best men player in the world, what he thought of all this. And he said, I don't know what all the fuss is. She's a woman. She can't play both ways. She can't play in the men's. And besides, she's old enough to be their mother. What are they afraid of? <laughs> Do you feel that you are being discriminated against, and if so, how? Well, I'm being discriminated against by being deprived of my right to pursue my avocation, not my profession, because that's medicine, but my avocation, which is tennis. And I feel that I have the right to play tennis 
the same way that I have a right to alimony if I marry and divorce, and the same way that I have the right to reduce life insurance premiums for life insurance as a woman. I have all the rights of women, and I have enjoyed them so far in my life, except for being excluded from playing in the U.S. Open, which is the pinnacle of every tennis player's uh, aspiration. Yeah. If you were tennis officials, if you were the officials running the Forest Hills tournament, how would you get around this? I think that some screening test is appropriate. I'm not sure, and perhaps Dr. Harris or one of the other doctors could elaborate on that. I think some screening test would be appropriate. And then in a questionable case, have a gynecologist examine the person, any certified gynecologist. And then you'll have your answer, is this person a man or a woman? Right. Dr. Dorothy Harris has a PhD in physical education and sports psychology. She's a professor at Pennsylvania State University where she directs the research center for the study of women in sports. Dr. Harris, just to pick up on what Dr. Richards was saying, is the chromosome test a fair way of determining gender insofar as it's relevant to sports performance? I think it has been. Um but as we become more sophisticated medically, then I think we have to develop other ways and devise other ways of perhaps, and, and other tests to uh, make a fair analysis because the chromosome test only determines whether one is genetic male or genetic female. And that in essence only provides the blueprint for differentiation of the gonads so that one, if one is a genetic male will develop, a normal male will develop testicles and the female will then develop ovaries. And then all the differentiation thereafter is left to the secretion of those gonads. And so I would say in the case of Dr. Richards, the, the, uh, the influence on skeletal development, on, on muscle mass, uh, which are very uh, obvious changes with adolescents in males, and there are changes also in females, more fat percentage, um, and some of the things that we test in terms of, of efficiency in sport. Mm -hmm. And I think it has only implication for sport. Why, could you tell us briefly why this kind of testing has become necessary in, in sports, particularly international sports? I think at what cost winning and the fact that there have been violations and it was only beginning in 1968 in the Olympics that they started doing this. You mean people were actually sneaking men yes, into competition? Yes, a gold medal, a, a world record holder of a high jump who was a German who was forced as a male to masquerade as a female and take that medal. Uh, has created a problem. There, a Polish sprinter who unfortunately was the, go the gold medals that she won in the 68 Olympics were reclaimed uh, after it was discovered that, that she had masqueraded. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think there are problems. I think the implications are greater because there are countries in this world where gold medals are pretty important. And if there is an advantage to be gained, I think uh, many nations would resort to that advantage in countries where, the, where males may not have a choice. How do you view Forest Hills asking Dr. Richards to take a chromosome test? Is it just hypocrisy because they don't want her in the competition because they're prejudiced, do you think? Or are they trying to be fair in their way? I huh? think they're trying to be fair to, the, to other women. Uh, and I would say in all fairness that there aren't many 41, 42-year-old female professional tennis players who can play as well. You don't see them playing in Forest Hills anymore. And I think the fact that, that uh, 25-year-old female professionals do not do as well um, against Dr. Richard is significant. I think that's just one example. Yeah. You don't see very many 42-year-old males still playing professional tennis either. No. So you think uh, Dr. Richards does have yes, I do. an advantage in, uh, uh, in the terms of their, her capability, tennis capability. Mm -hmm. And are there other, any other tests? which could equally determine the extent of her Well, we advantage. do this for, for both now males and females in, in international competition looking at <coughs> anabolic steroids to see if males and females, as I said, now are gaining an unfair advantage by artificially inducing androgens, which include, improve muscle mass, therefore strength, therefore the ability to generate power. And interestingly enough, in Montreal, one female athlete was disqualified for evidence of taking anabolic steroids. Uh, so we have to even monitor male athletes that they don't try to enhance their own maleness or predisposition to muscle mass by artificial or synthetic ways. Could I just ask Dr. Richards, uh, you'd like to reply to, uh, Dr. Harris evidently thinks that you do have some advantage because you play better than 25-year-old, that is much younger, professional 
women tennis players? The answer to that is that I did beat one 25-year-old professional tennis player. That's not the same thing as beating Chris Everett. And this one professional that I did beat was making her first tournament debut as a pro. From the people that I have spoken to who have played Chris Everett and have played me, <clears throat> they're almost uniform in their agreement that she would be an overwhelming favorite if she were to play me. I would also like to correct one thing that Dr. Harris said. It's true that the German athletes that were mentioned were masquerading as women, but the Polish gold medal winner that she referred to, Olga, was not such a person. This was a woman in every sense of the word except for the fact that she had testicular feminization, which Dr. Granato can elaborate on. She had an XY pattern chromosome, but she was reared from infancy as a girl and became a woman and was a woman. And it was a horrible shame that they took her gold medals away from her when she was found to have an XY chromosome pattern. I would agree with one exception that, that this problem, this pathology was discovered prior to adolescence and therefore the influence of androgen did not develop, influence her structure. Post-adolescence, I think then you have the benefit of all the influence of increasing levels of androgen through adolescence and so you get all the masculinization Okay, let's go on to discuss transsexualism itself a bit more. There are more than 10,000 transsexuals in the United States, 3,000 of whom have been operated on in this country. Although the first publicly disclosed sex reassignment operation was performed at John Hopkins University Hospital 10 years ago, transsexualism is known to have existed since ancient times. Roman, Greek, and other mythologies mention people who have, quote, the body of one sex and the mind of the other. Historians and anthropologists have documented cases of cross-dressing and gender confusion in all cultures. Until the late 1920s, psychiatric treatment had been used to treat transsexuals, but was unsuccessful. In the 1940s, Dr. Alfred Kinsey referred one of his patients to Dr. Harry Benjamin, a doctor researching the endocrine system. Dr. Benjamin was among the first to define transsexualism as different from homosexuality and transvestism. He later became director of the Harry Benjamin Research Project, which treated hundreds of transsexuals. The problems of transsexuals and the possibility of sex reassignment was brought to public light by Christine Jorgensen in 1952. In the last 24 years, thousands of sex reassignment operations have been performed in the U.S. and abroad. One of these was done on the noted British journalist James Morris, who wrote a book about it entitled Conundrum, From James to Jan. In it, Jan Morris outlines her problems with transsexualism, saying, I was three or perhaps four years old when I realized that I had been born into the wrong body and should really be a girl. Dr. Charles Illenfeld is a physician who worked with Dr. Harry Benjamin for more than six years in the treatment of transsexuals. Dr. Illenfeld, what exactly is a transsexual? Exactly, it's a very hard question to answer. Uh, the simplest definition, the one that... Uh, people generally assume that a transsexual is a person whose body is of one sex and whose, whose mind is of another. And I think that uh, it's easy to think of it in these terms when you speak with people who do have gender uh, uh, confusion or gender problems because uh, they have a very, very real sense that uh, their mind, their spirit, their psyche uh, is at opposite poles from their body. Um, we know certainly that the um, body of a transsexual um, male who wants to become a woman uh, has no demonstrable physical endocrine or chromosomal abnormality, nothing that would differentiate this person from someone else who is a male uh, with a male gender identity. Likewise, um, in genetic females who feel that they should be males, there is no demonstrable is it more common difference. one way than the other? Are there more? It appears to be more common in the genetic males who want to become women. I see. And how does transsexualism differ from um, homosexuality or transvestism? Well, we think of transsexualism and transvestism. Transvestism is a condition in which, uh, in the male, 
in the genetic male, there is a desire for uh, episodic cross-dressing as a woman. And this is generally done for erotic purposes. Uh, this is a syndrome that is unknown in the genetic female, I might add. Um, in homosexuality, we have someone who um, identifies as a male or as a female and simply prefers sexual partners of the same sex. Do you know anything about the causes of transsexualism? One can speculate. I would defy uh, anyone at all to tell me exactly what is the uh, cause of transsexualism. Uh, my own feeling is that it probably has at least a twofold origin. Um, we know from uh, work done in, on laboratory animals and also work done um, in intersex conditions in human beings that there most likely is some prenatal effect of androgen on the developing central nervous system. Uh, whether or not this alone is enough to cause uh, uh, the gender dysphoria to the degree found in transsexualism, I, I can't say. I certainly don't think this is enough. The psychoanalysts have been able to trace the origins of uh, cross-gender identity back to some of the earliest phases uh, during which the infant individualizes himself or herself as uh, an entity separate from the mother and then develops his own sense of identification. Um, my own feeling is that we're probably dealing with um, a phenomenon that is based predominantly in rearing, but most likely has, in most cases, some sort of underlying neuroendocrine um, basis foundation. I see. So, so people have some, they are born with some predisposition towards this, and then the rearing right. then can, could intensify I that. I think that when we're born, we all have um, multiple potentials for development. Mm -hmm. And I think that the people who develop uh, a gender dysphoria uh, in adults probably have some disposition that other people don't have. How do you decide when um, people who are transsexuals present themselves to you for treatment, how do you decide which ones it is appropriate to treat with the operation and which ones not? Right. Uh, the university clinics find that between 11 and 18 or 19 percent of the people who come applying for sex reassignment turn out to be what they consider good class A candidates for uh, sex reassignment. The answer lies in um, an enormously detailed investigation into, um, into the background of the individual uh, as an extended period of in-depth psychiatric interviewing. Psychologic tests sometimes help, but generally don't show anything that we don't know, as well as, um, as physical uh, and laboratory examinations into the individual. Following all of these things, um, it is essential that the person who uh, appears to have a gender dysphoria, which can be helped by sex reassignment, and certainly this is not the case for all, but those who appear to be good candidates, <clears throat> excuse me, should then undergo a period of at least two years of living in their desired gender role so that they can prove, first of all, to themselves and then to their doctors, to their families, and to society at large, that come willy-nilly, they can make it in their new role, and that indeed they prefer life in that role to life in the old role. Thank you. Dr. Roberto Granato is a urologist who's a professor at Columbia Presbyterian Medical School in New York. In the last seven years, he's performed some 200 male to female sex change operations, including the one for Rene Richards. Uh, Dr. Granata, how complicated an operation is this? Uh, I apologize for this disgregation from your question, but I must, otherwise it would be unfair to Rene Richards and to many other transsexuals who are probably listening to us now, if I don't make a statement about the, my feelings about the chromosome test oh, yeah. and about the previous conversation that we had. To begin with, chromosome test will tell us whether an individual has an XX or an XY pattern. Besides, in many, many other cases, will tell us whether an individual has an XXXXXY, four X's, and a Y, or three X's and a Y, or three X's, and uh, in some patterns will be so mixed up that some of the cells of the individual will be XX and the other XY. 
we call it this mosaic. So if that individual was raised as a girl, although has a male genitalia, and if that individual feels uh, spiritually, sexually, socially, as a girl, has an apparition done, they seek the part of the glands which are secreting the androgens. I try to make it as lay as possible, my uh, uh, nomination of the... You're almost the, succeeding. <laughs> sorry. Yep. Uh, the part of the endocrine system which secretes the male hormone is removed by the castration naturally. Yep. That individual, as far as I'm concerned, has a, the feminine attitude of a girl, has the feminine attitude in, when it comes to sex, has a, 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 a feminine sex, has the breast development, has a vagina with which can have normal sex and enjoy it and have a normal orgasm. As far as I'm concerned, that's a woman. And that should be allowed to play in any woman's competition. To do otherwise is hypocrisy. Number two, I want to answer to Dr. Harris. When we were talking, or they were talking about the syndrome of feminizing testicle, that girl Olga. I will define it in a lay way for you. A syndrome of feminizing testicle is one in which individual was born with testicles. Testicles which secrete normal amount and sometimes higher than normal male hormones. However, and that's the great point, the individual developed into a female, female in shape, female in appearance, female in spirit, and so on and so forth. Why? Because the hormones secreted by that by those testicles are not integrated and not elaborated by the, by the cells of the body. It's as if I were talking to you in Chinese and you don't understand me. I talk. I, I talk, I can talk like a machine, but you don't understand me. The same thing happened with the a syndrome of, of a feminizing testicle. So although in those patients the, the title of testosterone, which is the male hormone in the bloodstream will be high, they are female. Okay, that was a very special case um, that you were discussing with the Polish um, athlete. And the Olga. XXY, yeah. the Kleinfelters, yeah. and so on and so forth, they have two or three X. So are they called female or male? On top yeah. of it has a, a, well, a white chromosome. I'm afraid you've made those points now, and now we don't have time to ask you okay. in detail about the operation. Right. Um, I just wanted to come back. We have a minute left. I wanted to come back to Dr. Richardson. <laughs> Is tennis the only area in which you have had problems in readjusting, and is it confined to your sports performance, or what about the other parts of your life? I think that I have been very fortunate that I have had no difficulty, socially or professionally, in adjusting following my surgery. I have been welcomed into the medical community. I've been welcomed into the wonderful community of Newport Beach, California, which is my new home. I don't even think of it as a new home anymore. And I've even been welcomed tennis-wise in Southern California. Uh, the only place that I have been unwelcomed is Forest Hills, which happens to be my birthplace and where my father still has his home. However, for some other people, uh, this adjustment hasn't been as easy as it has been for me. It's been easy for me because I have a profession that I can still practice. I have friends that still love me, and I have a family that didn't throw me out and still loves me no matter what shape or form I'm in. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm sorry we didn't have more time to discuss all this, but thank you all for coming. I'm Robert McNeil. I'll be back tomorrow evening. Good night.